Um, not quite a success yet, because success comes when we make more money than we spend. And <laughs> that's not happened yet. It almost happened last year. But um, yeah, so my name is Kate Stone, and I'm from my company, Nevalia. And I, I guess what we're trying to do, and what I've been trying to do for quite a long time, is do that thing about bringing things together, bringing the different technologies together. So, and the way I tend to like to do presentations, I'll just tell a bit of a story, how I started and kind of where we've got to now. But sort of say, starting from the end, I guess, the things first. Um, where we are now is that we're a small company based in Cambridge. There's about 10 of us. And that's kind of our little space there. And I think what's fairly unique about our company is we're a, a, um, a really diverse team, um, a whole sort of range of skill sets. And that, I think, is why it is so difficult to do that sort of magic bit of integrating and bringing things together because you can't be a team of similar people and do that. It needs that, that range of skills and it's very difficult to bring that together or even to justify what types of people you need. And that's been my challenge over the years from when I started. Um, so back from when I started and my background is um, I did a degree, in, a degree in electronics and then a PhD in physics and then I joined um, Plastic Logic, the company that you heard mentioned earlier, and I think I was the third engineer, maybe the fifth employee, in a really small office and in a small lab. And I worked there for, for four years, and um, looking at how to make circuits from organic transistors. So that's my background, and really as, as, as a scientist. And my story really is about my journey from sort of the transition from being a scientist and discovering more of my creative side, and about how I sort of pulled the two different people together and the types of things that we can create. So when I left Plastic Logic, it was quite scary because I started out um, on my own um, in my garage and I kind of sneaked back to the university, went to the skips, pulled out bits of kit and I turned my garage into a little clean room. And in my little clean room, I started to print transistors. Um, and I did quite well at it. I printed some things quite high resolution, sort of 30 micron tracking gap. Um, I had my transistors working, and I was really pleased with my sort of scientific achievements and thought that the world would beat the path, you know, beat the path to my door. And but what I really quickly realised over only just a few months was that, as proud as I was of the sort of science that I created, what people wanted was products. And when when the companies I spoke to asked me what I could bring them back in a few months, I kind of told them that I was developing technology that was on a three to five year time scale. Um, and they told me to go away, basically. So that kind of taught me a really big lesson that, for me, in a small company, the science doesn't pay, and that my lesson in business is that the products do. But what happened is I discovered a real love for printing, and I discovered a lot about printing. Um, and that's, I think that's been the most amazing thing that's happened to me over, over the last eight years, which is where I started out. And when I was at Plastic Logic, it was inkjet printing, and, and that was printing. But I kind of realized that for most of the things around us, that isn't printing. Printing is offset um, and flexo. To me, predominantly, are the main processes that we look at. And it wasn't just printing. It was also what's you know, known as, as converting, so the converting processes and the other deposition processes. Early on, um, I went to, um, to a factory in a forest that makes a lot of the material for crisp packets. And what amazed me in that factory is that they had the same processes that you find in a silicon fab. So they had evaporation processes, sputtering processes, um, plasma enhanced chemical vapor deposition processes. Um, and these were to make crisp packets. And those processes in a clean room making silicon chips do things on a batch sort of slow process. So my education in microelectronics was all about vacuum processes being a big red cross and the types of things we're trying to avoid. Um, but what I saw is that they were they were using this factory to make, you know, they were evaporating material at something like 60 or 70 kilometers an hour on three meter wide webs. And it just, it astonished me seeing that. Putting down 20 or 40 nanometers of, of aluminium, putting down silicon nitride, silicon oxide. So there's all these processes that I saw in the printing industry that was similar to the electronics industry, and I wanted to kind of explore those more and see and see how I could use those. Um, 
I'm a little bit obsessed with electronics as well, and kind of always have been. And I'm kind of a bit embarrassed to say that when I was a kid, my bedroom walls and carpets were riddled with wires connecting all little different switches and speakers and microphones and stuff together. So we're always like obsessed with what with what you can do with electronics. So I guess kind of where I got to was thinking about what if the pervasiveness of printing could be combined with the power of electronics. And I moved away from the early stuff that we were doing, or that I was doing with printing transistors, when we still do some of that work in some of the projects, but predominantly what we do now, um, it's about combining conventional silicon devices with printing. And the other discovery that I've had probably, I don't know, over the last sort of four or five years, or actually, in, in terms of seeing what you can do with a silicon device with a microcontroller, it is amazing, but the discovery really that I've made over the last sort of two years or so with some of the partners that we've worked with in the toy industry is that you can buy the same microprocessor that was used in the Apple II for less than 10 cents. And that, if we could just get that die and put that in a piece of print, we could then make a piece of paper effectively be a computer, but using 20, 30 or so years old silicon technology with hundreds of years old print technology and combine those two things together. So for me, printing is the user interface. It's the thing you can touch. We can print conductive tracks. And on the chips, we can run software for capacitive touch and other touch processes, and software for sound, and software to communicate to other devices. And that kind of creates that platform. But printing is already the world's communi communication interface of choice. It is why we have big banners up and not big screens up everywhere. Um, printing is something that, that, that is obviously is everywhere, from table surfaces, walls, floors, newspapers. Um, but when I kind of spoke to a few printers and said that I want to run some conductive inks in their presses, um, they were kind of telling me that it couldn't be done, and so I kind of got about 10 credit cards and loans, a mixture of those two, and this crazy spreadsheet, and I, I bought myself this printing press, and it's a fire station gas printing press. Um, and the thing was huge, it's over five meters long, and kind of to set this thing up, and luckily the, um, the university actually gave me a little bit of space for free, and they paid to plug it in, which was a little bit more than just kind of plugging it into the wall. Um, and I taught myself how to print, but I made an absolute mess. I covered myself in ink, I covered the floor in ink. Um, one key lesson I learned is don't turn the press on unless all the doctor blades are down, because <laughs> <laughs> I ended up in the right mess. Ink went through the whole thing, all over all the rollers, and it took a lot of time to clean it up. Um, but I learned how to print, and then when I went back to the printers and showed them what I was doing, their reaction was, why didn't you come to us in the first place? Of course, of course you can do this. Um, but I'd kind of shown what you've done. Um, I used to show this slide actually quite a while ago, but I kind of just, it, it resurfaced last week at a presentation that I gave, because it's something that I did earlier on, and it was kind of a key transition moment, really. Um, I was printing things and printing circuits, and all the lines were kind of squares, you know, rectangles. Um, I tried to make things look a little bit creative, so I put some curves on them and I made the buttons be little yin-yang signs. And I thought that was me being creative. Um, and back then, there was a company came um, along and said, can you make a cart and do something different? And I thought, I'll put a little light on the inside so people can see what's on the inside of the carton, because that might be useful. And there was a student working for me <coughs> at the time, and she looked at that and she said, why would anyone want that? It's totally useless. And she came up with a cat that had um, eyes that had LEDs that lit up when you opened the carton. Um, and I think you were, you were someone that really liked that when you saw that. And I think a lot of people really loved it when they saw it. And at the beginning, I didn't really know why. And it really taught me the whole value of being creative and the whole adding the whole creative side to everything that we make. Um, so the first person that I hired was actually a graphic designer. Um, so that kind of rather than you know more scientists, so that's that's I think what set me off on this sort of direction of of creating a diverse team, seeing the things that I couldn't do, sit, listening to people and seeing where some of the value was if we could only do those things and adding those members to the team. So um, we created someone, a graduate from the um, a local university in graphic design, and this is the first thing that she made, which is a greetings card um, where. All of the silver line work in that is actually the circuit. 
and then <coughs> what I would do, so she'd do the artwork first, so kind of one rule at the beginning is that art and design comes before technology, and that's always quite a battle with the engineers, because they think their stuff comes first, but it doesn't. <laughs> and so we do do the line work, and then I'd go into Photoshop and put little cuts in the line work, and then kind of let the circuit find its way through the artwork. And I'll show you again. So the idea is where you touch the card, it, there are switches. So naturally where you touch it, you activate it without having to know what to do. And then the little LEDs light up. So the LEDs light up on the cave. Sorry. Sorry. Um, and then you blow out, because there's a moisture sensor, so some of the ink is a moisture sensor. Um, and then you blow the candles out, but only two of them go out, because that's kind of what happens in life, so you have to blow on it again. Um, and then it plays a little tune for you. So what we're trying to create is this sort of experience of a user with a piece of paper that's not just open it and it does something, it's touch it and it's this dialogue, this ongoing dialogue between you and a piece of paper that has to be intuitive. And that's kind of the, the experience that we were trying to create. Um, yeah, we then work with, um, we did some work with a US packaging company and we made this fire carton. And the idea is that there's a printed insert that will go on the inside, so it's added to the carton just like um, a leaflet or a label would be. Um, and then when you touch different parts of the carton, it makes different sounds. So the sounds on these two things are just sort of piezo based, not quite a good quality sound, but it, it just shows about how we can make, make something interactive. Lost the sound now. <laughs> So there's all these different sort of sound points all over that carton. And the idea is, is it's to try and make, is it a carton or is it a toy? And it's to try and sort of blur that boundary between what is packaging and, and what is a toy. Um, so this is just actually one, one of the places, one of the factors where we, we've done some of the <coughs> um, And Nick, I mentioned you again, but you took these photos. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, just sort of saying that, I mean, the printing press that I bought, sold that a couple of years ago, and realised that any printing that we, that we do has to be done by people who are professional printers, and it has to be done in industry by companies who know how to manufacture. So, this is the type of place where, where we'll do some printing. Um, actually, Robin, you might recognise some of these pictures too. <laughs> <laughs> On the phone to you, please. <laughs> Um, so yeah, this is some lifelike printing, um, and that's me measuring it at the end. And I think what's really important is that we use a standard industry process, and as much as possible when we're somewhere like that, we don't want the, the press people to make any changes. We want them to run things as they are. We want them to try and use substrates that they're used to using. As, as little changes as possible, so they can run this stuff down their press, and they can create a piece of interactive print. So. Yeah, this is a bit of a, a marmite sort of demo that people love or hate, but we made this poster, I call it a DJ poster. <coughs> so you can touch these different, you've got a screen next to it. So it's running for plastic touch, so it's live that printed in the So, yeah, it, when I first described that demo to the printers and the people we were working with, we had this large piece of paper that was white and did nothing. And I said it was going to make all these basically sort of Tim Westwood style DJ sound effects. Um, and then people looked at me as if I was a little bit crazy, which maybe I am. But I mean, why would anyone you know, want that or like that? But when we made the graphics and when we added the sound and when we made the you know, we made the experience and we put that on YouTube and sent that back to the printers and, and they were instantly sending it out to their customers and they were really excited because it just showed a piece of paper doing something totally different. And I'm not trying to say that's a product, because all the demos that we create, they're just there as a means to communicate what a piece of paper can do, what a piece of print can do, and so that whoever <coughs> sees that can go, that's interesting, I can see what it can do, but to me it would be such and such, and then they kind of automatically translate that. Um, so something we've done with um, another packaging company, um, 
I think we did this printing in um, East Kilbride. The other printing was in Sheffield. Um, and we're looking at making a farmer carton. And making a farmer carton that has some conductive tracks in it. So when you take your medication, the carton also has a chip in it and circuit board and some LEDs. And so it knows when the medication's been taken. Um, it also has what I call the am I there yet button. So you know, you take your medication, two seconds later you think, did I take my medication? And you can press the little button and the carton can say, don't worry, you've just taken it, it's fine. Um, and then a little LED will come on and remind you as you're getting closer and closer to take the medication. And that's the experience that the person needs to have, a positive experience of the carton helping them to do something that they may be otherwise find difficult. But actually the real functionality is that it's monitoring when the medication was taken and when the carton goes back empty to the pharmacy, um, when the medication was taken can be uploaded to the pharmacy and the doctor can then know. So it's really it's all about medical compliance and seeing if people are taking their medication when they should and also when they, then when they say they actually are. Um, but I believe it should be a positive experience first and then sort of doing the monitoring and watching people second. So, something else we did with the packaging company in the US. Um, so, I always like to say that I believe no tissue carton is complete without a little piano on the side. And I have no idea why no one else has thought this before. Every tissue carton needs one. <laughs> the idea is really that um, we were working with this packaging company, and well, I should also say, none of the things are products yet. They're all things we've created with people that they used when they inspire their customers. So we were working with them, we were at the design center, I think it was in Philadelphia, and asking them about what sort of their customers like, what would drive their sales, and they were saying one of their customers makes tissue cartons, lots of them are sold in um, petrol stations, and so we thought if we added a toy on that was something for the car journey, it might also help someone to buy the tissues, something they could then sell it at, you know, two, three, or four sort of times or twice. And so we color coded the keys. Well, on the side is a little tear off color coded tab with the lyrics for Twinkle Twinkle Little Star that you stick that in the top. So anyone who's not color blind and can read can play the piano. And then there's a little website that's on the side. So on the smartphone they can go and they can download all the tunes and then they can play, they can play other things. So we were looking at how we could start to link people emotionally to the internet. So how could you go from a piece of print to the internet <coughs> without using any technology, just kind of using an emotional desire. So something else that um, we created, we were working with a book company and um, I've been to a lot of the book fairs with them and met a lot of the publishing industry and what they asked, um, if asked us to create is, is a book that, um, it has a little headphone connection in, in the side, so it looks like a normal hardback book but we have a little headphone connection in the, in the side of the book and um, they wanted it with a book read to you. Um, which, and they said that in the book industry, the way they communicate what a book does or new technology is white blanks. And so they wanted a white blank book with sound in it, which I thought if they're going to do white blank sound, it was just basically going to be some noise. And I didn't really think that was a very good idea. So I kind of, I went on Wikipedia too. So some, you mentioned Wikipedia. <laughs> I went on Wikipedia, got some text. I went on Google Images, got some images. I went on YouTube and I got some sound files. And so I put in some different things, because what they originally envisaging was just it's a book that just reads a story to you. Um, so in the back of the book, I put um, a pneumatic keypad, which is a printed capacity touch keypad. So for the moment, we, we can't put the hotspots on the pages, but maybe that's you know further down the line. But keep it simple, keypad in the back, you type in the number on the back page, relevant <coughs> to a little bit of text, and then you get to hear some audio. And I wanted to add audio into that book that you, you just you couldn't have in a book. So you're reading about the lunar landing, and then you actually get to hear the crackly sort of like one great step for man and you know whatever that they say is actually the real audio, and it's much more emotional. I mean, you can read it, but it's just not the same. And then there's an interview, a really funny interview. Patrick, well, I find it funny. Patrick Moore and Neil Armstrong um, that I found. There's other things in there. So there's um, there's there's one about meditation, and I bought a book on meditation, and I thought I'd learn to meditate, and it's really, really difficult, because the first line that it says, and the first line that this says is, 
close your eyes, and you can't read a book and close your eyes at the same time. <laughs> it's pretty difficult. Um, but with this book, you can. Um, I also put in Nigella describing her chocolate brownies, and you can't have Nigella describe chocolate brownies without hearing her. And then two Ronnies in the four candles sketch, which again, if you saw it in text, it wouldn't work. Um, so we've done a lot of stuff with sound, um, and then we've more recently been working on, on something um, differently. Um, and this is about light. But it also translates to what we, what we actually really want to do and what our longer term vision is um, with, with silicon dye. So down the bottom left here, this is the blue tacky tape that's normally applied to the back of a wafer when it's made in fab. And then it goes on the saw or the scribe. So these are all individual dye. And they're 200 by 400 micron, something like 200 by 400 micron um, dimension. And they're LED dye, so you can see the little pads that are about sort of 50 micron or so uh, connection pads. And what we want to do is take those LED dye, there's one of them there, and then apply them to a substrate and connect the print directly to the dye. Our greater vision beyond that is that we want to take the microcontroller dye, which are a couple of millimeters in size, but could be as thin as 80 microns. Because the problem with, say, using the LEDs or using the silicon microcontrollers is the packages that they've been put in are specifically designed to be soldered onto circuit boards. And so there are efforts that people make to attach chips directly to print. But I believe that what we really should be trying to do longer term is get the dye <coughs> attached directly to print. Because if I can take that sort of eight or nine cent Apple II microcontroller and get that embedded in a piece of print so small that you can't see it, then we could make the paper do really amazing things. So these die, they're so small that when I have them on the end of the tweezers, I don't know that they're there for sure. I just kind of have to believe that I've picked them up. Because it, it's kind of like picking up pieces of pepper. Um, and they're so thin that when they're stuck down, you can't feel them. But they're so bright that when they connect, they actually actually hurt your eyes. So um, that's, a, and I actually did that with, um, three pieces of sellotape, a pair of tweezers, and, and a piece of crisp packet. But I managed to connect to the LED and get it to light up. Um, yeah, this is going back to some of the other things. This is not something we've created, but we're working with Dundee University, um, and we're sponsoring a PhD student there. And then together as a group of us, we, um, we wanted to go to a conference, and so we picked South by Southwest. Um, and we went to South by Southwest earlier on this year, which was, which was a lot of fun. And um, they designed and then we printed um, these paper headphones. So we made head so these headphones that kind of come on a large sheet and you pop them out, fold them up, and then they've got piezos in them. And we made these paper headphones and we were giving them away at South by Southwest. And that was kind of fun. Um, and we also did this poster, which was with the other people in the team, which is a design agency from Liverpool. And they, um, they designed this poster and we printed um, this poster that when you touch the different music, sort of hot spots, you get to hear a little sound clip from that particular band. Um, and um, this in particular um, got picked up by the BBC and it was on the on BBC tech sort of website for the day of South by Southwest. <coughs> and it went all over the world and kind of the telephone rang and it was all a little bit crazy. Um, and it's really weird because it just, it's so difficult to know what things will inspire people and, and, and what won't. So we just kind of create this range of different things. So we're exploring again more about how we connect paper to the internet. So we've written an app on the phone, and there's a piece of print on a postcard, and it's a it's a couple of um, millimeters thick. And when you touch the buttons on the postcard, it talks talks to the app that we've written on the phone. And the technology in that postcard would cost in volume less than fifty cents. So it's not very expensive, and it's in a format that people are used to using. But it can talk to a phone. Um, and you know, then the phone. I mean, that's just the simple thing that we did. We used to do a demo quickly, but we've now made it so um, it can play a video, it can link to a website. So you can have pieces of paper that start to interact with the phone. Um, you could have a giveaway in a magazine or something that you're know, using the phone as the video player. So you don't need a phone on a piece of print because you can't. So you don't need a, a screen on a piece of print because you've got the screen in your pocket. But the, the paper is the interface. It is the thing you want to touch. It is large. You don't necessarily want your fingers you know, all over a screen that you're trying to look at at the same time. So we're trying to look at low-cost ways of communicating. And that is a very low-cost way. 
Um, and then more recently, as well, um, we've been exploring the use of uh, Bluetooth, low power Bluetooth. And I presented at an event about a month ago, I think, about a month ago, called the Festival of Media, and it was in Montreux. Um, so we did a jazz-themed demo. So we did two demos. Um, so this is the jazz-themed demo. So the I, I'm not, I was so tempted to show it live, but it's always a bit scary showing a demo live. Um, so I made a video of it. It's horrible, it's me, man, I didn't want to me, but... So it's low power Bluetooth connected, it actually connects to my iPad. So, and I do have a demo here, I could run it later. So when you touch the different instruments, the iPad starts to play the music. Um, and they will play in sync. So, We called it um, the jazz jam. So you can make this piece of paper, sort of be this jazz jam, and all the music plays in time. And that that was really um, liked a lot by a lot of people in the music industry. And this is actually my my last slide, pretty much. So, um, and this is something else that we also took to Montreux. So this is another poster. So these posters are like A2 in size, and again it has Bluetooth on, and it's a it's a new form of Bluetooth. It's called BLE, which is Bluetooth Low Energy. So it can run off a coin cell. Um, and the chipset will be quite, will be reasonably low cost in volume, so definitely less than two dollars. Um, and it's starting to become available on different devices. So unfortunately, it's not on the iPad 2, so I had to buy a new iPad, which was you know, such a pain. Uh, so I have a new iPad. It's on iPhone 4S. It's on Motorola Razr, and it's starting to come out on, on more phones. Um, so this one. Um, as well as print and electronics, I'm kind of a little bit also obsessed with cake. So we did a poster about cake. And so this poster, when you touch it, it has a speaker in it, um, and the poster talks to you. So it asks you a series of questions about cake. So it asks you what's your favorite flavor, and your touch, and then your texture, and your priority, um, what's your special occasion. It's quite funny, we give all these choices, but most people will pick chocolate, soft and gooey, or dark and dense. They'll say taste, and they'll say because they deserve it, and they pretty much everyone ends up with a chocolate brownie. But there's all these options. There's about 60 different cakes or so. But and, and they've lived, they lived for ages. I like, stare at it, going, mm, "Which one I'm going to take?" And I'm like, "I know exactly what we're going to press. It's crazy. There's no such thing as choice." Um, but it doesn't tell you what the cake is. What it does is it uploads the name of the cake, a description of why the cake was chosen for you, and a photo of the cake to our Facebook page and to our Twitter feed. So if someone on their smartphone goes to our Facebook or Twitter, they'll see the latest cake that's been uploaded, and they'll see what the choice um, is for them. And then maybe they'll click like, or maybe they'll click follow. And um, we don't have many followers on our Facebook page, because it's not something we really push very much. But in Montreux, one of the other speakers was Amazon's CTO. And um, as well as me having a little boogie with him on the dance floor, which was very weird, um, he also clicked like on our Facebook page. So I reckon he's worth about 10,000 followers. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so really that's kind of the end, I guess. But so what it's all about is, for us, what I've discovered, it's about creating this diverse team. And I guess I didn't say what some of the other members are of the team, but so um, there's graphic design, we have a product designer, we have um, embedded electronics engineers, software engineers, so a software engineer that can write software that sits on the chips, that can sit on the print. Um, a software engineer that can write Software that sits on the computer, sits on an iPhone, sits on an, on an iPad, or you know, another sort of smartphone. We have someone from the print and ink industry. Um, I think that kind of covers yeah most most of the team. So it kind of shows like all those different diverse skills. That and and it's really weird. Every demo we create, we see everyone's skills in that one particular demo, and I think that's why people aren't bringing things together because it takes such a wide range of skills. So thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.